Prior to 2017, I'd been a journalist, I'd been a science writer, I'd been a cartoonist with two graphic novels published and one full-length, uh, book-length web webcomic. That's probably it. And, um, and on Monday, October 9th, 2017, the Tubbs fire made me a wildfire survivor. That's my house. That's my refrigerator on the right there. Does this thing have a laser? Yeah, that's my refrigerator. Back here is a, I think that's a washer or a dryer. You can still see little spot fires burning. This is about six hours after the fire. I, uh, I went back into my property to see what was left. Um, that's my home. Uh, the next day I went to a Target store. Uh, we moved in with my daughters for a month. They live in Novato. And I bought uh, clothes and I bought food and I bought shoes because I had evacuated wearing a pair of stupid sandals because they were the closest thing to the bed. And I bought art supplies. That's all the art supplies I could find at a Target, was a spiral-bound book of really bad paper, uh, four-colored highlighters, and uh, some, some Sharpies. And uh, so I started writing and drawing. I wanted to tell our story. Um, uh, so I, I used to be a journalist, and I realized I was in the center of an historic event, and I, I felt obliged and obligated to tell our story. And so I set out to do that in the form that I work in, which is comics. Um, over the next few weeks, as, um, as was alluded to, something like three million, million people saw those first rough drawings I did and put online. And uh, I take some credit for that because I think I'm pretty good at, at what I do. But um, I, I got messages from people all over the world who said things like, I saw your fire on the news, but your story was the first thing I read that made me feel what it was like to be there. It's right here, there's the line right there. Uh, your story was the only thing I read that made me feel what it was like to be there. And um, that's why I did it, and I'm grateful for that. That story was later expanded to a full-length graphic novel that looks like that. I meant to bring one. It's sitting right on the counter by my front door, and I didn't bring the book. But that's what the book looks like. And um, I'm going to read a little bit of this book today. Now, the trick with doing a reading with comics is y'all read faster than I can talk, so I'll, I, I'll control the pace here, all right? So, on Monday, my house disappeared. Around 1 a.m., my wife Karen snapped awake. The electricity had gone out. I smell smoke, she said. That's just the Calistoga fire. It's 20 miles from here. And my wife Karen says, but the smoke is blowing sideways like fog. I'm sure everything's fine. We haven't gotten any phone alerts. And Karen looks out the window and says, and the sky is glowing. So we dash out of bed. Karen um, wishes I hadn't drawn her in her nightshirt, but I am, an, I am an honest reporter. I tell it like it was. And we scramble in the dark. We loaded the car. Enormous masses of hot air moving at hurricane speed raised a hoarse whispered roar punctuated by the muffled cracks and thumps of distant explosions. Those were propane tanks going off. Is everyone awake down here? Yes, I think so. Should I hose down my roof? No, leave. And right about then a fire engine comes through, Arr, evacuate now. So we did. Talking to neighbors, are you guys okay? Yeah, we're leaving. Karen says, come on, let's go. Where should we go? Your office. My wife Karen at the time was the director of Sonoma County Human Services, and so her job was to set up shelters and get people evacuated from places like the Valley of the Moon Children's Hospital, which was run by the county. And so we went to her office because we knew it, it was a few miles away from our house. It had a backup generator, it had uh, vending machines, it had internet access. We knew that was a good place for us to kind of set up shop. And so Karen got right to work. She's, she's evacuating people, she's setting up shelters, and half the people she's trying to contact don't even know anything's gone wrong, but she's calling people at two, three, four in the morning saying, it's time to get to work. You know, let's, let's, let's do it. Uh, meanwhile, I was relatively useless. I walked the dog. A couple of hours later, after sunrise, I set out to get as close to home as I could. She said, don't do anything stupid. Who, me? I drove to the first roadblock, parked in a nearby lot, and started walking. My path took me over Highway 101, an artery linking Los Angeles and Oregon. Six lanes, empty. I'd never seen it empty before. The fire jumped the freeway a couple of miles south, but I didn't know that yet. The sun was a dim orange disc behind a salmon gray curtain of smoke. I inhaled my neighbor's lives. 
I kept waiting for somebody to stop me, but no one did. Usually, whoops, yes, usually busy roads were almost deserted. Almost. And then a guy rode by on a bike and said, hey, man, it's horrible back there. Uh, okay, thanks. I walked the same back streets we'd driven out a few hours before. These blocks looked all right. Everything would be just fine. The street made a gentle curve into my neighborhood. As I rounded it, I knew. Fuck. Fuck, 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 fuck. Again, I'm an honest reporter. I picked my way down the middle of the street to avoid smoldering debris that had collapsed into gutters, alone on a sterile plain. Black toothpick trees, madly tilting pillars of brick and stone, and the twisted steel frames of garage doors. Hell. A fire hose split and melted on the street, a valiant last stand routed into retreat. A fallen hoop that a boy lobbed basketballs at for hours every evening after dinner. The steel posts of mailboxes twisted and stretched like hot summer taffy. Tommy the cop bought a house next to one he'd been renting. His family moved in last month. Lou had a model train layout, taking up half his garage that was already decorated for Christmas. Nana Tony always baked focaccia for block parties, despite being too infirm to attend herself. Bob and Robin left for Rome two days ago. Their car bled molten aluminum into the gutter. I looked down my street, stupidly hoping to see a miracle. I used to have five redwood trees in my front yard. I saw a refrigerator in the rough shape of a car I used to have in my garage. I didn't recognize anything else. A two-story house full of our lives was a two-foot heap of dead smoking ash. That's the start of a fire story. I've chosen some other passages, some other readings uh, for various reasons. I think they illustrate different aspects of our experience, including some um, that are maybe a little lighter than you'd expect. On Tuesday, I bought shoes for walking and boots for digging. This is at the Target. I saw things I needed two days earlier, furnace filters, printer ink, light bulbs, and realized I didn't anymore. It's unnerving to need both everything and nothing. You can tell at a glance if a shopper has lost everything they own. Underwear, socks, shoes, bottled water, toothbrush and toothpaste, one light shirt, one heavy shirt. You look into their cart, they look into yours. Sometimes it sparks a conversation, usually a nod. Um, so we, as I said, we, we moved in with our daughters for a month. Uh, we have two grown daughters who live in Novato and they, um, we're gracious enough to take them in. I guess we raised them right. Um, so once we kind of got settled there, we had some phone calls to make, and I'm calling PG&E. Uh, yes, I need to cancel our gas and electrical service. We lost our home in the wildfires. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, sir. We can take care of that right away. I just need to ask a few questions. Are you transferring service to another address? Eventually, we don't know where yet. Are there any fences or locked gates blocking the electric meter? No, the entire neighborhood burned to the ground. I'm sorry, but I need to go down the checklist. No, no fences or gates. Do you plan to move any gas appliances? I don't have any appliances, gas or otherwise. Are there dogs on the property? And when I, I always imagine my dog Riley perking up when she hears that. You understand what happened, right? Uh, the checklist? No dogs. And will our workers have clear access to the gas meter? Unlimited access, but there's no gas meter there anymore. I called our auto insurance. And what is the estimated cost? Estimated repair, same guy. Estimated repair cost. Whatever it would cost to buy another five-year-old Honda. So you would describe the vehicle as a total loss? Yes, it's totally totaled. Oh, I see. I took, I took some pictures I can send to you. Do they show the license plate or vehicle ID number? No, those melted. Being part of something so big makes perspective elusive. During the fire, we lived in a bubble. We saw very little television, heard nothing from the world outside. Friends and relatives across the country knew more about what it was happening here than we did. 
Weeks later, we still lived in a bubble, a tiny bubble of our family, our property, our losses, our problems. Then we take a drive, mile after mile, hour after hour, ruin after ruin, thousands of other people's bubbles as real and urgent as ours. There's a ridge in the Fountain Grove neighborhood where you can look down into a valley a couple of miles below. On the other side of the valley is a distant ridge that parallels the one you're on. Beyond that ridge, a farther row of higher hills. Virtually everything you can see from horizon to horizon burned that night. All in all, the firestorm claimed about 350 square miles. It's a big number that by itself means nothing. It's about 15 Manhattans, seven and a half San Francisco's, one and a half Chicago's, one third of Rhode Island. Perspective, it's the comfort and horror of realizing you're not alone. So we, um, I, one of my daughters is an archeologist, which turns out to be amazingly handy when you're sifting through ruins. Um, so she brought all the equipment. She brought the archeology span equipment, so I'm using one of the little sifting tables they use in, in a, a real archeological dig. And, and, uh, and my other daughter is, uh, works for museums, so she knows how to restore things that have been damaged. It was, it was, when we put them through college, we had no idea. So anyway, a, couple, a few weeks later, we were allowed back in our property, and we're going through it, trying to find anything. We found very little, but trying to find anything that had survived the fire. Ah, oh, hell, here comes a chaplain. And Karen says, your turn. A group sent around crisis counselors from time to time. Oh, I must have skipped. Oh, darn it, I screwed up my slides. Let me see if there's, no, okay. Well, I missed a, I missed a slide. Uh, the the uh, chaplain asks, how are we doing? And we say, oh, you know, same as everybody. And the chaplain says, yeah, I've seen a lot of blocks that look just like this. I say, at least we all got out alive. He says, there was an older couple over that way who got trapped in their garage. We heard, horrible, but at least they perished together. Well, we're grateful. He says, not as bad as Hurricane Katrina, though. I saw bodies floating in ditches there. Well, the chaplain and I have a moment. And then he goes back to his work, and I go back to mine, and Karen says, how'd it go? And I said, Pretty well, he just needed someone to talk to. This struck me as very funny and also very sad because this poor guy was just so burned out from going to, from disaster to disaster to disaster that he was useless. He was not helping me at all. He wasn't helping himself at all. He needed to t go home and you know take a few months off. But bless him for being there. Um, he, he was not helping. Um, I'd like to conclude, part of what I did in, in A Fire Story when I made it a book is I wanted to tell other stories. I want to tell other people's stories. And so I interviewed people and basically just reported verbatim what they told me. I interviewed people who were richer than me and poorer than me and who lived in different geographic areas and, and tried to kind of pull out some commonalities and also some differences in our experiences. Um, and so one of the people I interviewed was uh, County Supervisor James Gore, who was our local elected official in whose uh, territory, most of the Tubbs fire happened. So I interviewed him uh, months later. And he said something that I think um, really, really struck home with me. He said, the idea of resilience is not that you never get hit, it's that when you do get hit, you can take it. People talk about the new normal in the context of it being a horrible, apocalyptic, changing environment. I say that the new normal is how we rise to that challenge. The new normal is us. And I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. And I think that's what this, the people in this room is about, is becoming the new normal, changing the way we approach these things. Um, so that, yes, we're going to get hit again, but we're ready for it. We're more ready for it than we ever were before. And we can bounce back quicker than we ever have before. And I think that's, that's an important message that resonates very much with me. Um, finally, um, my book has this, this motif of daffodils because they were the first sign of life that came up through the ashes. The daffodil bulb survived, and months later, we see the green poking out of this plain of gray dust and, and muck. And um, it, was, it, was, it was very moving. And so uh, this, is, this is an entire page in the book, actually, just for this one daffodil drawing. And I never tell anybody how to interpret any of my books. If, if I put it out in the world, and if you take something different than I intended, that's great. Happy to do that. But if 
somebody wanted to look at these daffodils and take that as some sort of symbol of life arising from lifelessness, of hope arising from hopelessness, and uh, renewal arising from destruction, I would not discourage that interpretation. And with that, that's, that's me. That's a fire story. Yeah. We, we do have a few minutes if anybody has any questions. Did we rebuild? Yeah, we rebuilt in the same place. Um, we're not that bright. No, we, uh, we, we don't live up in the hills. We live actually down in the flats. And as, as uh, Jennifer said at the start, you know, wildfire doesn't care where you are, not coffee park, but in a place one not, would not have expected to burn. So our rationale was, well, the 50 years of fuel load is gone, so we're relatively safe there. And with new fire codes and such, we felt pretty comfortable and confident rebuilding. That said, a lot of our neighbors didn't. Some of our neighbors rebuilt and said, I just can't live here anymore. It just gives me the heebie-jeebies. I'm out. Totally understand that and respect that. Um, we felt confident rebuilding in the same place, and so we did. And we've been in our house. Uh, we actually rebuilt pretty quick in about two years. So we've been in it for almost exactly four years now. Did you have a really nice fence? A really nice fence? <laughs> oh, that fence. We did build a fence together. Oh, yeah, I live in a neighborhood that's, that's on Mark West Springs Road, and um, uh, there was this great community effort to, to rebuild the fence that kind of surrounded, enveloped our whole neighborhood. And, man, we all got out there and with, with the nail guns and, and uh, donated lumber from, was it Meat Clark? Oh, we bought it. All right, we bought the lumber. But anyway, a lot of help from a lot of people, and we rebuilt that fence in a, a really, um, got it done quick. Not well, well, or skillfully, but quick. Have I taken um, the form of graphic novels into schools? And, and yeah, well, the, the the fucks are a problem, and my editor and I thought really hard about that because it's the only thing that keeps it from being fit for elementary schools. I'd ha I'd give it to a high schooler, no problem, but that we we but what else are you gonna do? I mean, my favorite story about that, and I'll answer your question, but my favorite story about the fucks is. Um, we have neighbors who are, who are older folks who have grandchildren, and the grandchildren could not understand what happened to grandma and grandpa's house. And so grandma and grandpa were living with the, their, their grandchildren and their children, and they would read the web version of a fire story every night before they went to bed. That was their bedtime story, because that was how the kids understood what had happened to grandma and grandpa. And every time they'd get to that page, and grandma would say, now this isn't a word we like you to use, but sometimes it's just the right word. Fuck, 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 fuck. And the little kids are. <laughs> <laughs> and they just had a delightful time with it. Um, but yes, um, the answer is yes. Um, I've, you know, it's funny, the list of places you mentioned, I've been to, um, I've been to Washington, I've been to Oregon, I've been to Colorado, I've been to British Columbia and Southern California, all those places, same places you've been, talking to the same people probably. And a big part of what I do is I'll, I'll, um, I'll often talk to high school students about, um, and a lot of times they've laid a lot of groundwork before I even get there. They've drawn posters and they've drawn their own stories and so we could just talk about it like that. And I'll give workshops about making comics and, and kind of um, how this is one way one can deal with trauma as I have, you know. This is, when something bad happens to me, I make a comic out of it. That's sort of how I deal with it. Um, I think it gives me some sense of control over a situation I have no control over. I can't, I can't stop the fire, but I can, I can tell the story the way I want to tell it. Well, the idea of community is, you know, it's funny because before, like many people, I'd sort of always thought of myself as a lone wolf making my way through the world. And, and you realize that something like this. No, it's, we're all an interconnected web. We all need each other. And uh, that showed itself in ways both large and small. Uh, we got lunches comped to us from restaurateurs. And, you know, I went to Home Depot to buy a wheelbarrow. And I bought the cheapest one. And the lady said, oh, no, no, we're going to upgrade you. And so she gave me, you know, the, the second cheapest wheelbarrow. Um, just little things like that, but in our neighborhood especially, um, a couple of things happened. I live on a court, we have 10 houses, and we all 10 got together after the fire and kind of put our hands in a circle and said, we're going to do this together, and we did. That's one reason I came back to the same house is because I had this tight group of neighbors all wanted to come back and do it together, and by God, we did it together. If my neighbors had been terrible people, I might have just moved on, but... Um, so that was important. And the other thing that was smart was um, James Gore, again, started this program of block captains. 
because what would happen was all the fire victims would get together in a high school auditorium and there's 800 people there and they're all in a terrible mood and they're all screaming and yelling and nothing gets accomplished. No information gets delivered either way. He developed a system of block captains to kind of distribute the, um, the, the information gathering both ways. So a block captain would be somebody who is maybe represented like a small neighborhood, 10, 15 blocks, something like that. And they would meet with Gore, and then they would come back and have meetings with the, the people in their little area. And so that's where you find out, well, um, we really need to do something about the streetlights, or our sewers are still not working, or something like that. So that's where you get the fine, gritty, actionable details instead of people just raving about all the horrible things that have happened to them. Um, so that was important, was that block captain system. And I, I thought that was brilliant. Uh, we've actually exported that to many um, communities in this room as zone captains is what um, the uh, campfire collaborative and uh, turned it into. And then up in the Alameda fire, they actually, uh, uh, there, Tucker, yep. So it's been um, exported in ways that have helped other communities because of what you guys leaned into. I'm glad to hear that because it worked beautifully. It was just, it was brilliant. Yeah. I, I, I'm six seconds over. All right. Thank you very much.